Yes mate, welcome back to the channel and in this video I'm trying to condense the highlights of the full 40 minute virtual event which TJ Zhang, the CEO of Avpoint, attended today. So I've got it down to around 20 minutes. It was very difficult, obviously I tried to get it as short as possible, but to still include some of the big talking points and the big things which I found interesting as an Avpoint investor. I would encourage everyone to go watch the full 40 minutes, but if you haven't got time, but you've got 20 minutes, then I've got you covered, watch this video. So, um, so yeah, sit back, relax, Grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a beer, Ribena, whatever tickles your fancy. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this. Good morning, and uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, Jack Andrews. I cover the uh, data analytics and infrastructure software space at Needham, and we're very pleased to have with us this morning um, TJ Jang, who's the uh, CEO of Avpoint. So welcome, TJ. Thanks for taking the time to speak with everyone this morning. Um, maybe just starting off, you know, for those who are uh, unfamiliar with that point, could you just provide a, a high-level overview and, and history of the, of the company? Good morning, Jack. It's uh, nice to be with you. Um, yes, on the AppPoint side, we we actually started the AppPoint with one other gentleman, uh, Mr. Kai Gong, back in 2001. So it's been a long journey. Uh, we have been a global Microsoft ISV independent software vendor. Uh, today, we are known as the largest uh, third-party SaaS data management provider for Microsoft Cloud, uh, specifically Microsoft Office 365. Um, our genesis has been around um, complex uh, enterprise content management platforms, started with SharePoint, which now became the entire fabric for Microsoft Office Cloud. Effectively today, within Microsoft Office, you cannot collaborate or share anything without going through SharePoint because we were the... Um, uh, biggest software vendor uh, and the uh, uh, most history in that space. And we transitioned to Microsoft Cloud earlier than most folks in the market back in 2011. Um, so today we really um, benefit from what's happening today with everyone working from home with increasing emphasis around collaboration, remote work and innovation. So that's really the um, big story of uh, where AppPoint came from and where we are today. I know, appreciate that. So just to sort of get into that a little bit more, I mean, as you touched on uh, the, the surge of remote work over the past year, um, we think about emerging products like Microsoft Teams. Could you just maybe speak to the impact that the uh, pandemic has had um, on AppPoint? Yes, so Microsoft Team has gone from 20 million active user seats towards the end of 2019 to now over 120 million end of 2000. Uh, 20 and the latest stats is about 150 million. These are daily active users. So Microsoft Team really became the killer app, if you will, for Microsoft Cloud, uh, especially around uh, M365, Microsoft 365. So it's really dragging up all the advanced workloads, including file shares, that's what we call OneDrive, obviously SharePoint Online, Yammer, projects. Um, of course, within Teams, you have video conferencing, you have instant chats. So it's pretty much uh, akin to Zoom plus Slack, all in one, right? Fully integrated with uh, Office products. And that obviously has a tremendous um, uh, momentum uh, given where we are because we uh, started with SharePoint and then obviously expanded into SaaS data management for Microsoft Cloud. And we became one of the earliest and big player in Microsoft Teams data management, data governance, and our core products that uh, focus around large enterprise customers in regulated industry and as well as federal government. So what COVID effect has done is everyone's going to cloud much, much faster. Your traditional technology like VPN does not scale. So folks need a way to collaborate and still work, continue the business while still stuck at home. So that's really the answer for most enterprises in Microsoft Teams. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Appreciate the commentary. So then I think the follow-up question, which I think a lot of investors typically grapple with is just um, how do we think about AppPoint post the pandemic? You know, you, is, is some of this spending um, sustainable or has you have you effectively front-loaded demand a little bit? How do you think about the opportunity moving forward in a more normalized environment? That's a great question. So the way we actually uh, design our overall portfolio is one of getting customer to cloud and then once they're there, get them to use cloud more, get maximize the ROI. And from there, obviously, continue continuous management. So what we have seen is customer gone to cloud faster. So that again, as I mentioned, uh, changes the order of things, how we engage customers, 
However, once in cloud, there's tremendous business for us to do SaaS backup, to do record management, governance, compliance, data privacy. So there's actually a lot more things to do in cloud. And also you see this massive momentum of cloud-based solutions replacing legacy-based data management, enterprise content management solutions in a much faster cadence than before. So all the challenges you had with traditional uh, environments that uh, large enterprise IT has to manage still exists in the cloud environment. It's just in very different flavors. So there's continuous uh, enhancement and continuous uh, governance for customer going to cloud. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Th thanks for that. So, you know, last time I checked, I think you were roughly, uh, we'll call it low single digit percent penetrated among um, Microsoft 365 users. Um, yes. Where do you think that can go over time? And just how do you think about, um, how, how, what are the key factors that you're using to try to drive penetration um, among Microsoft? Yeah, so we just announced our Q1 uh, earnings preliminary, and then very shortly we'll announce the final earnings uh, pretty much in range with our guidance. We have completed nine straight quarters of record growth. Um, so it's um, a hybrid, uh, but very importantly, high growth in uh, SaaS subscription business, high reoccurring, and also we have improved our dollar value retention to now 110% going quickly towards the industry best benchmark of 120%. So the, the, the market is, uh, is, is very good for us. We have low single digit penetration and no one else has more. That's the thing. The, <laughs> the market has grown very rapidly, very quickly. Um, so we have a first mover advantage in terms of having the right broad set of portfolio platform focused around data management end to end for Microsoft Cloud. So our stated goal is to get to 10% uh, market penetration in the next few years. And just doing that, that would get us to a billion dollar annual reoccurring revenue. So it's a massive, massive market. Got it. No, that, that's really helpful. Thanks. You know, you touched on it a moment ago and, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about the competitive landscape. You, you, as you we talked about your, you know, low single digit percent penetrated everyone else is it, it you know at best in the same boat or, or smaller so so how, how do you think about this landscape is this sort of a a, a land grab in, in your in investment boat or or just how do you see this uh, would you expect some people to fall by the wayside how do you think this is going to play out yeah so it's a it's going to be a um, land grab for now and then over time some consolidation um so it's interesting because we started, given our history in the large enterprise space, many of our customers are at least several, uh, you know, at least half billion dollar and up revenue levels, if not multi-billion, multinationals, regulated industry, government. We started in that space. So the competitor in that space, one, they're point competitors because they don't do the whole end-to-end -end because we started in SharePoint, became the biggest in SharePoint to do the end-to-end, -end, and SharePoint is Microsoft's enterprise content management platform, then for Office Cloud becomes the fabric foundation, if you will, middleware for entire Office Cloud. Um, we did that, we did the end-to-end, -end, so our, we come from a differentiated uh, approach, whereas our competitor would be point competitors. For example, you have Convo that just do backup. They back up everything under the sun, right? And, and you have Veritas that does that, and you have Veronas that just do file share security management, right? So it's very specific space. But what's happening now, especially with COVID acceleration, there's an entire market and concept called collaboration, security, and governance. So we feel that's our advantage. So in the enterprise space, we have a truly a first mover advantage. SMB space, we have an enterprise grade advantage. Either way, we have a platform advantage. So, so that's why um, we, you know, we feel very, very confident about our growth prospects going forward. Right. No, that, that's great. Thanks for delineating it uh, like that. It's really helpful. So just moving forward, um, I mean, is there a particular product extensions or just other functionality that you think are, are going to be important to, to add to your platform? Absolutely. So we play in all three clouds, but majority of our revenue still come from Microsoft Office Cloud, Office 365. Right now, we're about to roll out a set of products for Azure, which is their compute cloud, uh, as well as a set of product for Dynamics 365, which is their CRM and ERP cloud. We focus more on the CRM side. Um, as we also announced, we have uh, EduTech solutions 
uh, because Microsoft have just announced Microsoft Viva, which is their education platform integrating um, Office Cloud as well as LinkedIn. So we already have solutions built on top of that. Also leveraging Microsoft Cognitive Services, machine learning, natural language processing, AI, to do more vertical solutions. So we announced the education solution with exam management, all SaaS, exam management, um, testing assessment, learning management, training management, also HR talent management. So there's more and more things we can do because Microsoft's big focus and encouragement to all their partners to go vertical. As I mentioned earlier, all the legacy vertical solutions, if they're not based on one of the major cloud providers, whether it's Microsoft, Google, or Amazon, they're really at a disadvantage because the cloud platform themselves are iterating and innovating very, very quickly. Microsoft's you know, uh, enhancing their solution every two weeks. So we are building on top of that and enhancing there. So the combined iteration allows to leapfrog many of the legacy industry solution providers. No, that, that, that's really helpful. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit into some, you know, financial related questions here, which are just, um, you know, you, you, you're, you've talked about your recurring revenue increasing from roughly 75% to 85% over the next couple of years. Could you just talk about what, what's, what's uh, driving that, uh, that change? Yeah, so our reoccurrence is uh, growing very, very quickly. Uh, recurring sites uh, uh, close to 40% now. Uh, what's driving that big change is also we are we historically do services because we service large enterprises and government. Um, so historically, 20% of our business is services, 80% is in software. But in the next few years, the software piece is growing so fast and services we're doing a lot more channel engagement, that's the only way we can scale. We're gonna engage a lot more service partners to bring service revenue to them and then sell our software in conjunction. So we expect our service percentages to go from 20% today of our total revenue mix down to 10% in the next couple of years. So there's that drastic reduction of a percentage. Dollar volume wise is still growing because we're overall growing very quickly. Um, but that's the biggest driver there is the percentage mix of our software versus services, it's going to be much, much higher skewed towards software. Right. Got it. Okay. And then I want to go back to something else you, you touched on earlier, which is just your, your, your net, um, net, net retention rate. I think you, know, you talked yes. about driving it from 107 to, you know, industry leading, you know, 120% range is, is your That's objective. Right. Could you just talk about what are some of the underlying drivers? Is it upsell? Is it decreasing churn? How do you, uh, how do you sort of, intend on uh, marching along that, that path? Yeah, so it's ultimately the investment into customer success to do upselling, to decrease churn. So we have, uh, again, from a business transformation perspective, again, while we've been 20 years, we have gone through a lot of different uh, transformation of our business. We, uh, from a tech perspective, we came, we went uh, IaaS, infrastructure service, platform as service and SaaS as service in the early 2010s. And then also we went through this subscription conversion to convert our business into a, a subscription business from the traditional uh, maintenance and license business. And subsequent to that, we say, hey, we need to now pay very big attention to customer success because this way our revenue, it's much, much more predictable. Um, so today going into any year, uh, well over 70 plus percent of revenue is already spoken for because we have already a maintain, uh, minimum uh, expected renewals from existing customers and that's only increasing. So if we can get to, so in Q1, we already reached 110. If we can get to 120% um, dollar value retention, which is our intent in the very short order, uh, every year our revenue just grow 20% just by taking care of existing customers. And that's a fantastic thing. So then the sales organization just focused on going after new logos because the market again is vast. And then re uh, once the customer uh, becomes a customer, the prospect becomes a customer, then customer success take over and do uh, the upsell and uh, uh, lower the churn. Okay, that's really helpful. You know, I, I wanted to ask you one question that actually has come up in, in a couple of conversations I've had with investors about AvPoint, which is just, you know, as you as you mentioned, you, you've you been, you know, working closely with Microsoft for, for 20 years now. Um, but how do you, um, could you just sort of uh, unpack the relationship a bit more and, and just talk about maybe the visibility you have into Microsoft's product roadmap and understanding like the framework that they have of, of when when they want to you know partner with with players such as yourself to fill in some of the product functionality gaps versus 
when do they potentially want to step on somebody's toes, if you will, by introducing new, new functionality? And, and how, so maybe just sort of talk about that dynamic um, and how you, you manage that and, and how you get the visibility that, that, that you're comfortable with. Yeah. So all of the, um, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, and I get that every time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. All, all the senior leadership uh, at AppPoint are technical, uh, have technical backgrounds. Um, we have been, we, we call dancing with the elephant uh, for the last 20 years. Invariably, you get stepped on from time to time. Uh, we're in the, I always say we're in the software business. A year is eternity. Um, if we, you know, we don't cannibalize ourselves by uh, enhancing our product and get rid of uh, non-performing or legacy products, the market will, Microsoft will. Um, so we are used to that type of rhythm and dance. Uh, we have on our staff a, a, a great number of uh, what they call Microsoft MVPs. Uh, so these are uh, community evangelists that are voted and selected by Microsoft to represent the community voice. But very importantly, they also then get to sit across seven different Microsoft product and industry advisory councils. They're called PAC, uh, Partner Advisory Councils. So what that means is also we get to see uh, what's coming down the pipe from Microsoft um, a year to two years at a time. And we also are part of all of their TAP programs. So these are early release software programs in the world of SaaS, that means sandboxing. So we know what's coming, uh, minimal six months ahead of the market. Um, so we, we know how to take advantage uh, of that, we know where to invest and where to avoid. Um, so, but yeah, in terms of Microsoft coming out with solution that could cannibalize some of our solution, that happens all, all the time. It's it's a it's a way of life for us, and we're used to it. So it's not so much of oh my goodness, I only have one product and two product that generate ninety percent of my revenue. If Microsoft come up with a similar product, uh, our business is done. Now we've been doing this for twenty years. We have a quite a diffuse set of product line. Um, also, as I mentioned, we're going to industry vertical and even there, you know, Microsoft cannot do everything and they truly rely on partners to actually maximize Microsoft cloud consumption uh, by the customers. So yeah, uh, from that perspective, we're very well uh, set, set up from a product side. On the sales engagement, we're actually, even though we're not a big company yet from a revenue perspective, um, we, we are considered top five with Microsoft internal sales program called IP Co-Sale because we consume so much Azure. Uh, Microsoft has an internal sales incentive to work, have Microsoft sellers work with partners. Um, so when we close a deal, 10% of the TCV, total contract value, counts toward that Microsoft account reps uh, cloud consumption quota. So we're actually top five in this global program in the same club as DocuSign and Adobe, much, much larger company than us. That just means asymmetrically, we're very, very important to Microsoft sellers, very important to Microsoft CSM, um, customer support. They basically work with some of the largest Microsoft customers, making sure that they are using cloud, uh, lighting up all the workloads. And that's where we come in uh, to help them to do that. Um, so lastly, but certainly also important uh, on our board, we actually have uh, the corporate VP of Teams and uh, SharePoint and OneDrive, Jeff Tieper. He's a godfather of SharePoint. He, he's him and his group came up with SharePoint back in 2001. So we've been good friends for a long time. He's been on our board as independent uh, board member uh, since 2014. So we, we have that uh, good connectivity to senior management. Having said that, Microsoft is not an investor. Uh, we, we intend to keep it that way. Uh, we want to continue to support a multi-cloud world. Got it. No, that, that's really helpful. Thanks for clarifying that. I think we're just starting to bump up on time. So maybe the last question is just anything that, um, you know, do you feel is sort of misunderstood or, or unappreciated about AppPoint or just any, any other sort of topics that you think investors are, should know about that we haven't really touched on this morning? I think um, the market right now, obviously, everyone is looking at the tech market as uh, there's quite a bit of volatility. Uh, I think what uh, ultimately market would uh, recognize and reward are companies that are highly resilient um, and also have tremendous growth, continued growth opportunities, despite what the market may bring. At the end of the day, uh, technology is here to stay. Digital transformation is here to stay. Businesses have to... Uh, keep up with technology as a competitive survival advantage. IT is no longer nice to have, it's a must have. This is why we talk about digital transformation uh, and where every company has to be a technology company 
in order to thrive, uh, not just to survive. Um, so therefore, you know, from our, our perspective, we, we, we have a huge uh, first mover advantage and a platform advantage in a massive, massive market. Yes, the market today may be volatile and people in general are looking at SPACs as, uh, <laughs> you know, with, with a very tinted uh, viewpoint. Uh, AppPoint always started with two options. We were able to do traditional IPO or did SPAC. At the time, we decided to do SPAC because technically it was faster. Of course, you see some of the regular uh, regulations uh, around counting from SEC. But having said that, you know, uh, we're very much looking forward to become uh, a public entity very, very soon and continue our momentum and, and our continue our tradition of innovation and be a re highly resilient company. And the next, next 10, 20 years is even going to be far more exciting than the last 20 years.